welcome to this service of worship at the Princeton University Chapel. This service is for Sunday, March 15th, 2020. My name is Allison Bowden and I serve here as Dean of this chapel. This is the first service that we are broadcasting rather than holding as public worship. We do so in response to COVID-19, the virus that continues to expand across our region and country and world and which has caused the dispersal of the Princeton University community in an effort to stem transmission of the disease. Our hearts go out to the countless friends near and far whom we can't greet in person today. Our love and prayers are with you always. Hear this call to worship. Let us gather in many places at many times joined in a spirit of gratitude and of hope. Let us gather to thank God for every blessing in our lives and to pray that God may grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the living of these days. Please join me in a spirit of prayer. Bless us, O God, with the power of your holy presence in our midst, right now. Teach us the ways in which we are to be Christ's disciples in these troubled times. Shine your light upon the worthy paths that rise before us. Convict our hearts, embolden our spirits, instruct our minds, expand our capacity to love and to love and to love even more, even or especially when times are very hard. In the name of Christ who saved us, we pray. Amen. Our first reading is from the book of Exodus. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as God commanded. They camped at Riphidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test God? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to God, what shall I do with this people? They were almost ready to stone me. God said to Moses, go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it, so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the people, he called the place Massa and Meribah, because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? The word of God. Thank you. 
A reading from the Gospel according to John, chapter 4, verses 5 through 42. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Judean, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Judeans do not share things in common with Samaritans. <clears throat> Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God, and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, sir, I see that you are a prophet, our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship God neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Judeans. But the hour is coming and is now here, when the true worshipers will worship God in spirit and truth, for God seeks such as these to worship. God is spirit, and those who worship God must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman. But no one said, what do you want or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Surely no one has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of the one who sent me and to complete that work. Do you not say, four months more, then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around you and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into 
their labor. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. Here ends the reading. Did you ever play hide and seek as a child? I sure did, and I was awful at it. I never wanted to be the seeker. I never wanted to be the seeker because I was afraid that everyone would leave me for good as I naively covered my eyes and counted slowly to 10. I was also afraid that I would never find my friends and myself would become lost. I was afraid. I was also super excited and an anxious hider when it was time to hide, I would spend too much time overthinking my options. And when I would finally go to my amazing hiding spot, someone would already be there. I would then scramble to find another spot, and when I did, I was nervous and giggling so loud and worrying that they would find me, and they often would. I was anxious. Looking back, the truth is that I really didn't care too much for the game. I just wanted to be with my friends, running and jumping, giggling and having fun. Whether the hider or the seeker, the real joy is being known and being seen. Let us pray. God, be with us. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. In our Old Testament scripture today, we meet the Israelites as they are wandering in the desert. When they were enslaved people in Egypt, they had been forced to work long, hard hours. But as they remembered those days, the hardship began to fade into warm, fuzzy, rose-colored memories. All they could think about were the good times. Even though Pharaoh was oppressive, at least they had bread and water. They might have been beaten and whipped into submission, but at least they had enough to drink and enough to eat. They had 99 problems, but water wasn't one of them. However, once they walked across the Red Sea into freedom, they found themselves in a very different world. The Bible alternates between calling it the wilderness and a desert. In any case, it was a land where all bets were off. Nothing was predictable anymore. About three days after crossing through the Red Sea on dry land and successfully escaping the Pharaoh and his company, the Israelites began to realize that the water available to them was new and the land was barren and this water was too bitter to drink. All of a sudden, the stark reality of what freedom meant began to hit them. In leaving Egypt, they also left behind the harsh years of slavery, but they also left behind everything, everything that they had once known, including all that water. They began to murmur, and grumble and worry aloud. And God tells Pharaoh to throw a piece of wood in the water and by some miracle, it made it sweet and drinkable. Just a few weeks later, the people continued on their way when they realized that they were running out of food. Once again, they began to gripe and whine and complain. Worry and anxiety began to overtake them 
and God hears their cries and provides from them bread from heaven. Hebrew roughly translated to mean, what is it? Manna, what is it? They'd never seen anything like it, bread coming down from heaven like rain, and they could take all that they needed, daily bread, enough to fill their bellies. This manna would feed them until they reached the promised land. There will be enough each day, every day, until they reached their destination. And then we read today's scripture reading. Another text about worrying and anxiety and complaining. And in less than three chapters from the last miracle God had done for them, the people are worried again. When we read it, it's almost like God is saying, what is wrong with these people? Will they never be satisfied? How long will it take for them to trust me? After all that I have done for them, this time, the Israelites just didn't complain and quarrel against God. They turned around and fought one another, fighting, tweets, retweets. This was too hard for them to bear. There was not enough. They were thirsty. They were hot. They were not even sure where they were going. Some thought that they would die and all they could wonder was when is God going to show up and help us? They needed a sign. I can imagine that they took on the title of Judy Bloom's popular novel, Are You There, God? It's us, the Israelites. The Israelites felt like God was hiding from them, and they didn't know where to find God. In our New Testament passage, we meet a woman who has stopped even bothering looking for God. She is tired of being let down and disappointed. She has been abandoned by husband after husband, poor and without anyone to care for her. She has taken to seeing yet another man, another man who she was trying to avoid. She was trying to avoid people by going to Jacob's well in the middle of the day. The well, people showed up at the well to gossip, to complain about their husbands, to sigh about their children, to enjoy friendship with one another. But this woman, she did not truly belong. She wanted to avoid the crowds. And so she climbed a mountain in the middle of the day with sweat dripping down her back, her feet sliding in her sandals. And when she gets there, she thinks that she's gonna be all alone. And she glances over and there he is. I can imagine that her heart sank into her stomach. She came all this way and to be avoided and to avoid others. And there was this man. She'd never seen him before. He was indeed a stranger. As she looked closer, she could tell that he was a Jew. As a Samaritan, she had been taught that Jews were the enemy. Samaria lay between Judea and Galilee. Most Jews avoided it completely. There was another way to get here, so why was this guy here? She wasn't willing to speak to the stranger. She didn't have any words. However, Jesus had words for her. What is this stranger doing here? What in the world could he want from me? And Jesus gave her an offer that she could not refuse. Jesus was looking for her. My friends, have you ever felt like you were playing hide and go seek with God and God was really good at hiding? I don't know about each of you, but I feel that way right now. As I read the news about the rapid progression of COVID-19, as I go to the grocery store with long lines and empty shelves and I look around at a nearly empty college campus, and even now in this empty chapel, I wonder where God is hiding. As each moment changes, we find ourselves in the midst of an anxious season of life. Some are wondering about their jobs, reduced pay, 
fewer hours. Some have not slept as they've tried to make decisions around school closings and childcare. Some of us are immunocompromised or have loved ones who are vulnerable. There are those who are making big decisions. These decisions are hard and critical, and it will not come out fair for everyone. This feeling of fear that I feel, that you feel, it's contagious, and the anxiety is real. Everything feels so hard, and we feel like not only is God far away, but God seems to be hiding. We too have cried out like the Israelites, are you there, God? It is us, your children. And other times, we may not even be looking for God at all. Like the Samaritan woman at the well, we have become so used to doing things on our own, unable to trust anyone to help us out, that we have stopped expecting God to show up anyway. We come to church or we go through the motions, but we have stopped feeling any excitement or sense of anticipation about what God could possibly do. God, we reason, just doesn't do things like God used to do in the Bible. Miracles, that's nonsense. That was back then, not now. At least not to us. We pray, but we just mainly update God on what's going on in our lives in current situations. We don't ask for anything. We have become used to the silence. My friends, I want to let us all know that God doesn't have patience for hide and seek. But there is good news that we serve a God who loves to surprise us. Just as the Israelites were wondering aloud if God had forgotten them, water came gushing out of a rock in the wilderness, in the desert. Clear, cool water that quenched their thirst, Water that reminded them of God's steadfast goodness. Water that would be there for them to get them through the difficult spaces of this journey. God showed up. In the same way, the Samaritan woman ended up receiving something better than she could have ever imagined when she met this stranger at the well. Even though she was trying to avoid everyone and everything, even though she had lost hope in people and systems and institutions, there she was coming for solitude and she found acceptance in this living water, this living water that broke down all boundaries, this living water that changed her life, this living water that gave her a voice. Theologian and author Reverend Nadia Bolt Weber says, and I quote, the living water offered by Jesus Christ reminds us and finds our lowest points. It flows to your original wound, end quote. When I read that quote, I was reminded that in this moment, it is important that we pray that we let God's living water flow right now as we are experiencing what might feel like our lowest point. Let the living water the love and peace of an amazing God, fill those spaces, fill those spaces of anxiety and fear, fill those spaces that an abundance of toilet paper or gallons of hand sanitizers and months of food and face masks can't fill. Today, tomorrow, this week, and throughout the rest of our Lenten journey and beyond, you and I, we must learn to pay attention because our God is a God of surprises, and God is trying to get our attention. And the coworker who needs to talk, and that child that now needs childcare, and the disruption and inconveniences of this moment, and the cancellations, and the silence, and even in some of the isolation. Maybe, just maybe, this God of surprises is trying to get our attention. My friends, God is coming to find us. I am sure that God is coming to find us because the truth is, we are never lost. We serve a God who is always with us, and we may feel lost, but God is ever present with us. God 
who promises never to leave us nor forsake us. No more hiding and seeking, because we've been found. Amen. Please join me in a spirit of prayer. 
Our gracious God, we are challenged. Challenged by fear and anxiety, by loss of normalcy and of the close companionship of those who used to be around us. Challenged by worry about so many things that seem to be in a free fall. We pray that you will soothe our fears with the reassurance of a realistic grasp of all that surrounds us and with faith in your abiding presence throughout all that is lovely in our lives and all that is not. Help us to be sources of faith, courage, and strength to those who are around us especially those who become ill. We pray for all who are ill, for those now living with COVID-19, for those who would experience particular harm should they become infected, for all who are making great changes to their lives in order to mitigate the spread of the virus. We pray for all who are ill from any cause, including our friends Beth, Jackie, George, Marge, and Mary Ann. We pray for all who have died, and remember especially this weekend our dear friend, Professor Henry Horn, on the first anniversary of his passing. We pray for all who care for the ill, that they may be strengthened and sustained, we pray for ourselves as we navigate many new ways of relating to others and of planning for the immediate future. We pray for wisdom for the leaders of this country and every other one, that their decisions will be made with the well-being of every person in mind, especially the most vulnerable. We pray for those at risk of disease, and also those whose days are met with hunger, with violence, with homelessness, with a migrant's journey. We pray for all who do not receive the education for which their nimble minds are capable, who do not receive the health care of which their beautiful bodies and minds are in need. We pray that this time of global crisis will cause us to become larger human beings, more compassionate human beings, more just human beings, more faithful human beings. We pray that this time of global crisis will cause us to think and to feel more globally, to unite in the care of our environment, in the care of our poor, in the care of our children, our women, our refugees, and yes, of our sick. May the crisis in which we find ourselves help us to understand ourselves as powerfully interconnected, powerfully one, powerfully empowered to change all that needs to be changed, powerful. Each of these petitions and endless more, we lift up to you in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to say when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Each time we gather for worship at the Princeton University Chapel, we say this prayer for Princeton. O eternal God, the source of life and light for all peoples, we pray you would endow this university with your grace and wisdom. 
give inspiration and understanding to those who teach and to those who learn. Grant vision to its trustees and administrators, to all who work here and to all who bear her name. Give your guiding spirit of sacrificial courage and loving service. Amen. Receive now this benediction. Let us go into this week knowing, trusting, even foolishly believing that God loves us, that God is with us, that grace and peace is abundant. My friends, go into this week knowing that God is full of surprises, that we were never lost. God has found us. Amen. Thank you.